Hi guys, Kellen and I spend all of our time trying to figure out how to navigate complicated cannabis challenges. Today, we are excited to bring to you a solution for your accounting needs. Navigating 280E, keeping clean books, and providing financial and accounting advice is a massive headache for so many businesses. End to End is a team of CPAs with backgrounds from the big public firms that specialize in the cannabis industry. End to End is offering a no-cost consultation if you tell them the dime sent you. That's right, free accounting advice. Go to n2nadvisors.com now to take advantage of this. That's n, the number 2, n, a, d, v, i, s, o, r, s.com to get free accounting advice now. This is The Dime, a 10-minute dive into the cannabis and hemp industry through trends, insights, predictions, and tangents. What's up, guys? Welcome back to The Dime. As always, I've got my right-hand man, Kellen Finney, here with me, and we're breaking down cannabis topics in 10 minutes or less. This week, we're talking about a not-so-exciting topic, a cannabis controversy, DUIs. When you think of DUIs, you typically think of an officer pulling over a car on the side of the road and giving the driver a field sobriety test, which often ends up in the use of a breathalyzer. Kellen, what do they have to check for sobriety with cannabis? The roadside right now. And then if you don't pass the roadside, you get arrested. Then they take a blood test. And if you test over 10 nanograms per deciliter of THC in your blood, it's a DUI. How do they do that? They, what do you mean? Elaborate on that question. (laughs) So like they take blood out of the body. (laughs) But like how, so take us through that scenario, right? You get pulled over, the cop comes over, says obviously- Your eyes are red. Right. Yeah, your eyes are red. They literally look at your eyes, say you look stoned or it smells like pot, step out of the vehicle. And so at the end of the day, it's at their discretion. You know, everyone's different. It's not like when someone's intoxicated with alcohol, right, where they're inebriated and they can't like talk very well or anything like that. And so it really is just at the discretion of the officer. And there's it's a it's a really rough system. Um and there's just hasn't been precedent set to kind of fix it but clearly it's not being abused because you're not hearing about it in colorado at least i mean we've had legal cannabis for five plus years and this has been the rule for five plus years and i mean i've maybe i don't know any of my friends who've ever gotten a cannabis dui i knew someone who got a cannabis dui in college in arizona but that's the only one I've ever heard of, right? And so it's it's rare, but at the end of the day, it's at the discretion of the officer. So I'm driving right. a car, a uh, police officer pulls me over. He says, Brian, your eyes are red. I tell him, officer, I'm a lifeguard. He says, Brian, it's 9.30 at night in the winter. You're obviously not a lifeguard. There's no pool around here. Uh, he takes me out and then he does our test. What What's the legal limit? How does that work? Like how is it, it's a subjective understanding of the, the officer. Like, can you explain more about that? It's the same roadside test that they give to someone who's inebriated in alcohol. So it's like walk a line, say the alphabet backwards, those kind of things. And then after that, it's just, if they think you're, they're stoned, it's like, at the end of the day, if they think you're stoned and they ask you to get out of the car, the roadside is just for, they're just checking a box that they have to in, their, in order to f- further support their discretionary situation. But nine times out of 10, if the officer asks you to step out of the car because they think you're on the influence of drugs or alcohol, you're going to, you're literally going to jail. And so at that point, like it's literally all just smoke and mirrors. Like, I mean, at the end of the day, a roadside can't be used as evidence in the court of law, right? Like none of that even, so it's not even evidence, but it's just to help them solidify their opinion. So they just, they go through the motions. I mean, it depends on the officer. Some will make them walk a line, say the alphabet backwards. There's like another seven or eight that people can undergo. Right. And I'm not a police officer. Right. And I've never been pulled over and had a cannabis roadside at all or an alcohol roadside or anything like that. So lucky enough. But um, yeah, at the end of the day, that's what happens. And they take you to the police station and take your blood because that's the only reliable method for testing THC levels in someone's body at this point is through the blood. So they have to have an EMT come or a paramedic and take you to the hospital, have blood drawn, and then submit it to a lab for lab analysis. And so then they hold you until you get your lab analysis back. The hard thing that we really should be talking about is that individuals who have medical uh, licenses 
are constantly consuming cannabis and they may have consumed a bunch of cannabis the night before they may wake up not inebriated, but because they consume a ton of cannabis, they have a higher standard level of THC in their body. And so typically the average medical patient will have like 20 or 30 nanograms of THC per deciliter in their blood. So they could get pulled over, get a DUI when they hadn't consumed any cannabis. If the officer had a bad day and he wants to kind of prove something or there's a miscommunication within how that whole interaction is handled and the officer decides to arrest him and takes him to jail. And then he tests positive for DUI, even though he hadn't consumed cannabis that day, it's going to be hard to hold up in a court of law. So, but that just, that precedent has been set. No, unfortunately, no really rich guy with a bunch of money at his disposal has been pulled over and given a, D, a cannabis DUI who then can afford to take it to the Supreme court have precedent set and change the law. So that's how the law stands until a rich guy gets arrested. It's a really challenging issue, especially with the way he describes it with the blood test and kind of with the, the nanograms of the THC in the body and the understanding of exactly how much THC influences people to become inebriated is going to be a very complex challenge. So do you think there needs to be scientific studies around that? Like what's the process in order to get a better understanding to generalize it so that there's more of a firm understanding of what is legal? Yeah. I mean, they're conducting those kind of studies right now. And that's where they really came up with like the 10 nanogram per deciliter number in Colorado is based on those studies. Right. And so, I mean, it's hard at the end of the day, right? Like the 0.08 level for alcohol, came out of all these studies too, but there's certain individuals that have one glass of wine and their BAC is probably well below 0.08 and they can't walk straight. And you have another person who can literally drink 12 beers and they seem like they're fine. You know what I mean? So it'll always be kind of case by case, but they're going to have to draw the line somewhere. And right now that's where the line is drawn. And I mean, I just don't see further scientific evidence changing those kind of laws, right? Like they're always going to be super conservative. And at the end of the day, the only capital I see the federal government deploying in that subject is going to be to develop further more, more testing. Right. So I, I noticed I was at ACS in San Diego in 20. 19 and there was a couple talks about up in canada right because it is federally legal in canada and what canada is doing right now is developing a breathalyzer for cannabis so there's some cool technology that's going into there i think they're using like gold nanoparticles to help accentuate the the signal or increase the signal to noise ratio of the thc when someone's breathing and there's a bunch of scientists working steadily on developing the next cannabis breathalyzer. So that's where the capital is going right now, not to studies to determine how each individual based on body weight is affected differently by the amount of cannabis present in their body. Let's talk about Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. That's right. No more excuses. Get your lazy ass off the couch. Go start a podcast. There's the creation tool that allows you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Once again, no more excuses. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. Could it be easier? Even better, you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. That's right. They're paying us for this ad. Thank you very much, Anchor. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started now. So let's go to a listener's question. So, Ready? With alcohol, mm-hmm. 0.08. With THC, we understand the nanograms and we're still kind of flushing out, but there's a rough understanding of exactly what they're looking for. What about the products together? Obviously, if you have one glass of wine and a tiny bit of THC, it might affect people differently. And is that combination going to alter the way that the police officers have to infer this? Because that kind of takes it to a whole nother level because the combination effects is, is going to influence everyone a little differently. Yeah. So clear, <laughs> you get two DUIs is how that works. Right. So like when they take you in and draw blood, even if you're on alcohol, right. If they think you're drunk and they take you in and draw blood, like you get tested for everything. So say you're drunk, having a good time with your buddies and you do some other recreational drugs at the bar and you get pulled over and the officer's like, you're drunk. And they take you in and you decide not to do a breathalyzer. You decide to get your blood drawn. 
they're going to draw your blood and analyze it for everything. And so every single narcotic that's in your blood is now a separate offense. So say you are drinking a glass of wine and you smoke a joint at a dinner party and you drive home, you will now get an alcohol DUI. And then on top of that, you're also going to get a cannabis DUI, right? So you will get double dinged for that. And then it's going to be even, it'll be like having two DUIs and there's, then you're going to be classified as a persistent drunk driver in Colorado and like all these other things. It's 10 times more intense, right? You literally will be like, you just got two DUIs on your record. Let me ask the question a little differently. Let me ask the question a little differently. You're under the legal limit. So you've only had tiny bit to drink, tiny bit to consume cannabis, but you're both under the legal limit, but the combination of the two has altered you to be assuming or to, to appear more intoxicated. Is that a concern of yours at all? Do you think that's going to be an issue with the combination, both of them being underneath the legal limits? What do you think about that? Yeah. So an officer always has the discretion to determine that you, even if you, you are too intoxicated to drive, they don't take those measurements until after you're in the cop car at the police station. Right. So like they're not like, oh, 0.07, you're good to go. Right. And even in Colorado, I don't know how it is in New York, but in Colorado, they have what's called buzz driving. Right. So in Colorado, it's technically illegal to have one beer and drive. Right. So the legal limit in Colorado is 0.05. So it's not 0.08. 0.08 is another level of uh, DUI in Colorado. Right. So, I mean, the officer is literally going to arrest you for a DUI. And then you're going to go to a court, you're going to go to court and you're going to fight it in court. And it's going to be, the, the conversation is going to go like this. The officer's like, he couldn't walk. He couldn't talk. We took him, we took him to the police station. Yeah. He blew below the, the legal limit, but he also tested for, for cannabis. And at that point, the DEA, the DA is going to be like, you were, you were, had multiple narcotics in your blood and you were operating a motor vehicle. Like they're, you're going to get a DUI regardless of if you're below the quote unquote legal limit. Cause at that point, they're literally just going to cite the officer's discretion, right? And they'll probably submit some evidence of you talking and like all those little things. And like, yeah, I mean, you you could win, you could not, right? Like that's why you go to walk, go to court, right? So then you're gonna have to go to trial and try to prove yourself right or wrong at trial, <laughs> right? So, but my guess is you're getting the DUI and you're gonna get to spend multiple years in alcohol class and drug class and you'll get to, do all those fun things that come with getting a DUI in America. Can't go to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Prediction time. Uh, I didn't want to speak about the can't go to Canada thing, um, but w- well said. <laughs> well, 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 well put. <laughs> well, you, you can't. You can't. Facts. Facts right there. In case anyone's wondering. You can't. What will the issue look like when cannabis is federally decriminalized? Do you think there'll be policies in place to regulate them with one policy as a federal level, or do you think they'll be state-based? What do you see that looking like? My prediction is that we have this super cool dude named Elon Musk. And so he is actually going to allow self-driving cars. So by the time cannabis is legal, I don't think anyone will going to be driving their car anymore. So it won't be an issue. We'll have automated cars. So you can get, you can go buck wild and then get in your automated car, and you can't get a DUI. That's my prediction. <laughs> They're rolling out the subscription service this year, Brian. <laughs> I, I, you, I hope so, because I'm not, not the biggest. What do you do that? <laughs> what do I think of that? I think that's a great idea, right? I prefer not to have to drive if I don't want to, and if I could just sit in the passenger seat and do whatever I want and become inebriated, I, I love the idea of that, especially in a Tesla. But at the end of the day, well, that's a great idea and a great prediction. It's not really so realistic for the timeline I think we're really moving towards, which is in two years when it's completely legal. Oh, yeah, two years, babe. And it's going to be something where they're going to have to have like a very established firm ruling, like a point of weight. And there's going to have to be some sort of instrument that they can do some in the field testing to hopefully quantify how much THC is, is in your blood. And from there, <clears throat> make a determination if you can legally drive or not. And that's going to be a really rough determination. It's going to have all the same 
implications and the challenges that the alcohol has with the 0.08 and when, when, when larger people have more drinks or tiny people have one and it completely screws them up. It's, it's going to be a process, but at the end of the day, they just need some sort of guidelines in place in order to keep people safe. And hopefully that the research is coming out to have a, a better understanding of exactly what those limits are and, and what the possibilities are. And at the end of the day, with all the new cannabis products coming out with like the delayed reactions and the fast acting ones, I mean, who knows, right? What happens if you can consume a shit ton of cannabis really quick, be super stoned, and then in an hour be completely sober, right? Like that's a subjective feeling. And that could just be really dangerous, especially if you get on the road two hours later and you've consumed a ton of cannabis hours ago, but you feel completely sober. So don't know what's going to happen with that. That's a really challenging topic. And I'm glad that we don't have to be involved in those specific decision makings. Uh, I do want to shout out all of our international listeners, especially the South American ones. Thanks so much for your support and keep writing in with the listener questions. We, We look forward to hearing from you guys. See you next week. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your cannabis business podcast, The Talking Hedge, and newest member on PodCon X. So come on over and check out The Talking Hedge. We talk about business news, interviews, investments, events, all that stuff. So come nerd out with me over at The Talking Hedge. You can find me at thetalkinghedgepodcast.com or on all your favorite podcast platforms. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, or don't, and I'm out.